break from Silicon Valley, three generations of venture capitalists, and one guest judge equals... Meet the Dreamers! Imagine that. They wanted another season. <laughs> Entrepreneurs pitched... Billion dollars lost every year. We were both wandering aimlessly. The judges asked the questions. So what's special about you guys? Why will this stay on your platform? But here is the twist. You, the viewers, get to invest for equity. This is your chance to own a piece of the next big idea. To invest in a company, go to meetthedrapers.com, find them in this week's Entrepreneurs, and you can invest. You can share in their future success. At the end of the season, the entrepreneurs with the most funds raised are brought back for the season finale, where Tim Draper invests in his favorite company. Become an entrepreneur because it's easy to get money, and that didn't happen in Wall Street. Let the games begin. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Today we have a special guest, another Draper. We have Adam Draper, my son, who runs Boost. It's an accelerator for Bitcoin and blockchain and VR and AR and sci-fi. And my father, Bill Draper, one of the great pioneers of venture capital. Who are you? And I'm Tim Draper, and this is the last episode before our big finale where I fund some of these, or one or many of these companies. Stay tuned for that, but this episode's going to be something quite extraordinary. So tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a, in a family of venture capitalists. You know, it's a little like being the second guy who walked on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that guy? Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> oh, there you go. I it's looked it up chance. because of this. <laughs> <laughs> because of this. But each generation has taken such a different tactic at it that we've sort of created our own special categories. We just kept not competing with one another. I know, but we've done deals together. You were the first investor in Coinbase, and then... I came in later at a much higher price, and he was the first investor in Skype, and I came in later. You, uh, I'm the really guy. Who was the first? <laughs> how, he you what I wonder is wait, wait, wait. how he got to be the first investor in Bitcoin. Yeah, ever. Amazing. Tell us a little bit about your excitement and passion around exoskeletons. Back to a company called Rome Robotics. The first use case is going to be knee braces for skiing. So you could ski all day and never and never feel any weight on your knees. Ooh, bad for your knee. Perfect for do you. You can go. Yeah, I got a bad again. knee. That's I, good. I have an exoskeleton company for you. When was the last time you went skiing? It was you were I know. you were 82. I think I, I went up on the uh, ski lift Triple with you. Black diamond, I think. I, I know. I went up on the ski lift with him, and he said, "No, pops, be careful when you get off. You know that you you don't fall." And I said, God, come on, Adam. I've been skiing so much longer than you've been alive. And so I get off, and the next thing I know, I'm on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody's there taking a picture that of it. That was me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got a good picture took of a it. picture of As, it. I think I took the picture before I asked, are you okay? No, it was a good picture. I'm oh, that's you. right. VR, tell us what the big application of VR is going to be, and when am I going to be able to do VR without the tether. I mean, I was a top 300 player on Space Pirate Trainer, but that isn't the best. Games aren't the best use. The best use case, I, I work out in VR now with a company, with a product called FitXR, and then I t take pitches. I can do this. We could have this whole thing in virtual reality in a product called Arthur or Dimension 10. The killer app of virtual reality is being with people. And like, this allows us to do that without geographical borders mattering. So here, we're going to ask Dad and you. Okay, if I'm buying your house, would you rather take dollars or Bitcoin? I'm asking Dad first. Because of the uncertainty in my mind of uh, what the value of Bitcoin will be next year, I would like to get dollars. And Adam, which would you rather? <laughs> I mean, I'd rather have Bitcoin. Yeah, and this is really the case. There's sort of a point at sort of an age of about 35 years old where anybody younger than that would rather take Bitcoin and anybody older than that would rather take dollars. Okay, so with that, now you know who our judges are. 
Let's bring on the entrepreneurs. But first, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. I'm Zane Witherspoon, CTO of Dispatch, and I'm Matt McGraw, the CEO of Dispatch. We decided to build a distributed content marketplace. Fans could buy art directly from artists, music, albums, photography, without a middleman. Fans pay less, the artists earn more, everybody's happy. As we started building this out, we realized we couldn't. The technology just wasn't available at the time. My partner and I needed to find a technical co-founder. So we went to the San Francisco Ethereum Developers Meetup where kind of the largest mind share in the technical area of blockchain is. And we walked into his event. We ended up ideating on how we could use this new tech to like actually really impact the world. In the industry, there's a lot of talk uh, and a lot of ideation and a lot of really big vision, and there's not a lot of execution. My previous companies, we built platforms for all the quickly scaling startups that everybody uses today, Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, Airbnb, Uber, they were all my clients. I know how to go from zero to thousand. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. So we're sitting at a round table in the middle of a packed Macau casino. We're having a dialogue about business with these Chinese businessmen and their translators when one of the bigger men at the table leans forward and says in a really low, grumbly voice with shirt unbuttoned and chest hair popping out, my boss's name carries a lot of weight in this town. And that's when we realized we were sitting at a table with the Macau Mafia. So, <laughs> so once the pitch starts happening, it turns out that they are building a floating casino hotel and they want to raise $300 million in an ICO. And they want us to be investors, advisors, blockchain experts, the whole nine yards. So we're like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> but it taught us something. We realized that competency was a strategic advantage in the blockchain space. That everybody was talking a lot, but nobody was doing anything practical, real, and impactful for real businesses with real people using real products. Uh, myself being the technologist, I was actually really excited to see where sort of the pain points lie in this really nascent technology. Technology. And we pretty quickly decided on a protocol that could help provide users with data self-sovereignty and mitigates the risk of companies that use lots of data. Thanks to HIPAA and GDPR and the new California Data Privacy Act, data is becoming toxic. So can I ask you guys, uh, out of your investments, how many of them use data as like a main value proposition? A oh, lots of them. I don't know, maybe a third? Yeah, it's a right. lot, right? The largest and most valuable tech companies in the world are really data companies at this point. And now the new kind of regulations that are coming to the fore means that this is like a, a massive problem for almost every technology. <laughs> so what do you do? We are building the dispatch protocol, which is a network and we actually sell these tokens or software licensees to speak more traditional enterprise language to companies that want to create distributed applications where they don't have the risk of holding on to that data, but they can still extract that analytical value from it. We started building it in January, shipped our beta in April, and to date we've sold almost $13 million worth of pre-sale revenue. Pre-sale revenue? Who's paying you for software that hasn't shipped? We've got Fortune 1000, Fortune 5000 <clears throat> customers already, and they're building a data layer that stands between them and the actual data. And what this guy invented with some <laughs> magical math that I don't understand, I'm the software enterprise sales guy, he's the, he's the tech guy. You can do what's called zero knowledge analytics. So like zero knowledge proofs, you don't have to actually access that data to analyze the data set. It lets data researchers, whether that's businesses or universities, actually query data that's stored across tons of different owners and get back answers that they know are true without ever seeing the data themselves. What would be like an ideal customer? Apple. So Apple has a massive data set. We've all got iPhone, half of us have got iPhones in our pockets, right? So our protocol could allow them to actually analyze their data and derive that value without actually having access to it. What about a smaller customer? I mean, because when you're starting mm -hmm. a business, going to try to get <laughs> Apple as a customer right. will sink you. We actually have a bunch of smaller Fortune, say, 5,000 customers, and we've actually got Fortune 500 customers, too. When you fundraised, was it an ICO? No, we pre-sold the software licenses, tokens. And they're your tokens, they're not Bitcoin, they're That's your correct. tokens. That's correct, they're a native yep. token. What's it called? The Divi. The Dispatch the Divi. Divi. Mm -hmm. yep. 
And the Divi token, is that the only way I can use your software? Essentially, yeah. We run off of a rate limiting system so that you have to own some stake in the network, buy these software licenses, buy the Divi token, in order to get some number of transactions per day through. I think that there are a lot of people who are going after data as a distributed problem. They're mm -hmm. saying, like, everyone think... should have data sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Data is the oil of today. You should be able to protect your <laughs> people own People have been data. saying it for a long time now, yep. What is different about what you guys are doing? Right now, our main value proposition for businesses is actually being able to look at the distributed data network and extract that analytic value out of it. All right. Tell us about your background. My background is in cybersecurity. I found blockchain in early 2016 and immediately realized that it was going to be something that could revolutionize the world. And I wanted to be on the forefront of it. So I uh, wrote articles about Ethereum development. I had an academic business white paper published by Cornell University Library Archive. But most importantly, I started building community. I started organizing the San Francisco Ethereum meetup and actually bringing in all of these projects that at the time were just friends of mine who've gone on to become really big brand name projects in the space. So my background, I graduated from Cornell, oddly enough, uh, in 1994. I moved out to the Bay Area in 95. I've been a serial entrepreneur ever since then. My biggest success came from one company that I ran for 15 years. There's a company called Rocket Science. We were an IT services provider for small, quickly scaling startups. And I'm talking about Uber, Airbnb, Twitter, Foursquare. They were all my clients when they were small, when they were 10, 15, 20 people. And we helped them scale. Could you give us a clear picture of what you do for Uber, for example? I can tell you exactly what we do for Facebook, Google, Uber, Airbnb. They're all gathering your data. More and more, regulation prevents them from doing that, or at least holding it and doing anything valuable with it. We enable them to continue running their business while doing the same thing they've always done, but provide data data privacy for you and you and you and us and everybody here. You are limiting the use of that data. They won't be able to determine as much as they were able to when they knew who you were. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the level of data sovereignty that we want to provide to people. There's a lot of people I know who would love to use Facebook and Instagram, but actually don't because they don't want to lose their data. We provide a platform for people to disrupt them. We also provide a platform for them to disrupt themselves. That's Great. Here. Thanks so much for coming to meet the Drapers. Good. All right. Hey, great to meet you. All right. Oh, what do I have there? A dispatch sticker. A dispatch sticker. Great to meet you. I think it went pretty well. I think they were a little bit surprised at moments. Being a high-tech Silicon Valley startup uh, doesn't always translate to the real world as easily, um, but I think that overall, them asking for examples really helped us display sort of the power of what yeah. we're building. And they both, um, Tim and Adam in particular, get blockchain. They've invested a lot in the blockchain space, but I think that they were uh, surprised that we, A, have a product, B, have customers. You know, a lot of things that aren't real in the space, we have and are real. So. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see what the judges thought. Dispatch. What do you think? I really liked them. One of them was very experienced. One of them was definitely experienced in the cryptocurrency world. What I didn't get around to asking was about cryptocurrency has gone down a lot in the last six months. So they raised $13 million whenever they raised it. Do they still have Oh, do they still have that money? Or is it about a million dollars now? It's a big problem. I mean, actually, the data thing's really popular, but it is a very important thing that will be solved by something in this cryptocurrency ecosystem. If they have experience and they have talent, I think they're going to figure it out. I was astonished that they've raised so much money. We're guessing that that happened the end of 2017 when, when everyone everybody was raising tons of cryptocurrency. I guess it was that's easy. Right. Now it's a lot harder to do what they're doing. Yeah, time's changed. What I like about it is that this is sort of exactly what I think the vision for the future of medicine is. You're going to put all your data up into the cloud, but it's going to be anonymous. Well, they're parsing the identity from the data. Yeah. You know, my feeling is, in one way or another, they will succeed, because I, I did like both of them. They're really fine people that knew they were up against a lot of problems ahead, but they looked like people that would be able to solve those problems. Okay, so here's what we do. We go thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around, what, and then we vote. What it's is up and down. But before we do that, we have to go to the crystal ball. Okay. Yeah. And the crystal okay. ball will send us a vibe. I already oh, see. Okay, okay. Oh, so is this mm, thumbs up, thumbs down, oh, this mm, Okay, Ooh. we got it. Boom. Okay. 
Thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs up, down, up, thumbs up, all up, around. Whoa, look at that. Two up and one down. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what we think because you can vote up or down. Or you can invest by going to meetthedrapers.com. <laughs> now let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Mm. My name is Rick Bentley, CEO and co-founder of Cloud Structure. In 2000, I was CEO of a venture-backed company. We had an access control system, an alarm system, a guy at the front desk. And around lunchtime, someone walked in, dressed like us, picked up a notebook and walked out. That notebook had a lot of important code and everything else on it. Surely, the thief will be caught on camera. I bought the best system on the market, but there was no video. I kind of ran in the back of my head for a few years, and then uh, around 2003, I jumped in and started it. When Google indexed the web, they made it so you could search the web for things. When you have video surveillance data, if you have 100 cameras, just to review one day's of footage could take you a year. Unless all the video is tagged, it's lost. It's like the web before Google. We get back an index of everything in those videos so that you can search your videos for what you're looking for. So welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Hi, I'm Rick Bentley, CEO and co-founder of Cloud Structure. We're bringing artificial intelligence to building security. First thing we do is we get all the video surveillance data offsite into our cloud, along with all the access control data. You know, you swipe your badge and the door opens. Once it's up there, we do some pretty neat things. When we take all the data, we run it through an indexer. Now you can search for person, vehicle, whatever because we have your badge data. When you badge in, we see your face. Badge in, see your face. Badge in, saw both your faces. You went to lunch together. Badge in, see your face. By the end of the first week, we know what you look like. If I show up with your badge that I found at a bar, it can either flag it or not let me in, depending on your business rules. This isn't for everybody. It's for people who carry a badge. Yeah, it's for enterprise. Why would an enterprise be concerned with this? When I was at Google, we had a guy called the tailgater. He wore an alligator outfit. He'd walk around. When you badge in, he'd try and walk in behind you dressed as an alligator. At the end, all, all the Friday All Hands meeting, they showed the video of everyone who landed the alligator that week. Business is under constant penetration assessment from competitors, foreign governments, everything, right? They have stuff that's important that they need to keep secure, plus the safety of their employees and everything else. So you're solving the alligator problem. We're solving the alligator problem, right? <laughs> no more alligators. Where's the product like today? Do you have customers? Yeah. So we're doing 10,000 a month of recurring revenue, a little more actually. Uh, we have the cloud level working. We're just now rolling out the AI features. I see what the AI features are, but what's the cloud piece of this without the AI? Well, think of it this way. Look at the IT server closet. It's gone. There used to be an email server. It's now Gmail or Outlook or Outlook 365 or whatever, right? There used to be a file server. It's now Dropbox or Box. The first thing we had to do was get the video surveillance server and the access control server into the cloud where they belong also. And once it's there, you can do this higher level stuff that you couldn't afford to do computationally on-premise. And are they your cameras? No, we work with any camera. The largest universities in California has hundreds of cameras that are in our cloud. So if you have 100 cameras, how long does it take you to review a day of video? It's like a man year. Right, but once it's all indexed, I'm looking for a backpack. It's actually a man third of a year. 365 yeah, but, cameras. Right, but if it's 24 yeah. hours and you have eight hour days, it's 300, oh. right? Oh, okay. Plus yeah. weekends, you know, entrepreneurs okay. have to go to the bathroom and That's eat right. sometimes. Yeah, yeah so it, it, it's a lot, right? It's, it's right. overwhelming. So once it's indexed, whatever I'm looking for, I can find. That guy is spray painting the building, went to lunch with Adam a week ago. Adam, who's this guy? Right? <laughs> well, why are they so mad at you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who is interested in this? Who wants to hire you to do this? We're finding traction in kind of three areas. Education, utilities, and enterprise. So software companies in the Bay Area. Take the University of California. Why do they want it? In this particular case, our large university customer, who I'm not naming, jumped in and said, something happens, there's a slip and fall, there's a fight, there's a car crash. We go to get the video. The thing's been offline for two weeks. It can send us an email if this disk is full, it can't sense an email if it crashes or gets unplugged. It's just impossible to manage. Once you pull into the cloud, it's a one-stop shop. Here's my dashboard, how everything's doing. How much do you get paid? So uh, we charge $249 per year per camera and $199 per year per door. It's enterprise SaaS. 
And what's your experience? My background is physics engineering from UC Berkeley. I was at General Magic. General Magic. Yeah. Just raised a ton of money. Oh, was that fun? <laughs> VR. I'll bet you had fun while you were there. Why did you leave General Magic and where did you go from there? I started Televoke. Uh, Televoke was connecting people to things in 1998 before there was an internet of things. And what happened to that business? We pitched the Drapers back then. It's actually the second time we met. <laughs> <laughs> you did look familiar. Yeah, right? And we decided not to do it? You decided not to invest. How After, did we make that? So wait, right? how did, <laughs> did, did we make it? Wait, that, wait, yeah, let's find out what happened. How, did the investors make money on that one? So some did, some didn't. Remember, we closed our first uh -oh. financing <laughs> January 2000. We got an offer to get bought by Ford for $20 million. We only had three in the door. We took the offer. And then the Ford CFO shut down anything that was not profitable. And so we kind of pulled the rug out from underneath our deal. So then we merged with another privately held company and changed the name to Decarta. Decarta got bought by Uber after a long fuse for 2015. You had other outside investors? Yeah, so that was uh, SoftBank, W.I. Harper. And, and how much did they make on it, on their return? Depends which round. So the last round was the money round. The down round is the money round, isn't that the saying, right? Why are you excited about this? It has to happen. Video needs to be indexed or it's not useful. The guy at the front desk, when you badge in, he's making sure your face matches your badge. Doesn't matter if you're 5'6 or 6'4, right? Your picture comes up and that's it. He lets you through. I can use your badge, you can use my badge, I could use your badge, you can use my badge, right? We could badge in and oh, out. No, he's all got day. big eyebrows. Eyebrows. <laughs> I could do a little pre uh, <laughs> yeah. penetration test makeup. A little, little, little pre makeup. <laughs> There's a video on our homepage of me breaking into Google, Facebook, and Palantir because I have a messenger bag with a card reader in it. And I can just walk past you just because we are in this meeting together on the elevator at the coffee shop in line at Starbucks. I can read your badge. I now have your badge's unique ID. I can put that in another badge. I can badge in as you. It is criminally insecure. Yeah, if you'd like, I'll, I'll break in here tonight and leave my business card on your office door. Probably wouldn't be too tough. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that wouldn't take any technology. We got a lot of alligators. <laughs> did you write the software? No, I didn't write this software. That connects all the. My background is technical, but I'm, I'm the fundraiser, the sales guy, all the business. So who, who's written this? We have a team of about a half dozen of us. And they're um, full-time with the company yes. or they're doing other things too? Well, I mean, I, I, I mine Ethereum as a hobby, right? So we're all, we're all doing something on the side, but um, like everyone around here, I think. But yeah, this is a full-time team. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for coming to meet the thank Drapers. <laughs> Thanks. Real pleasure. Terrific. Yeah. Hey, thank you nice so to much. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you. Real pleasure. You. Good, great to see you again. <laughs> I have so much more to say. I got more demos. I got a product I can show. I could have been in there for two hours having a great time. We're bringing AI to something that every enterprise has. How many businesses have doors? They all do. They all need security. We provide what's happening. We're providing them the future. What's happening next is going to be the building is smarter and knows what's going on. I challenge that I break in tonight and leave my card behind. So maybe I'll actually do it. So let's see what our judges thought of Clouda's structure. I think he wants to win. He wants to hustle. He's had one reasonable small exit. He's obviously an entrepreneur in good a lot of ways, huh? That's what I good, good salesman. salesman. Good salesman. And I, I lose a lot of money on good sales people. Enterprise though. He's got to go. Yeah, that's true. He's got if you are an, an, right, if you are an enterprise, the good salespeople are extraordinarily and valuable. I, it's more than that. I think he really was a good uh, overall entrepreneur. He was upset that we didn't back him, but then we would have lost our money. Yeah, I, we were early. <laughs> sad, yeah. We were early. I we know, weren't the last I know, investor. In so fact, I was thinking, well, you know, you were upset, but yeah, we would have been really upset. That's the only problem that I've got with it. That I have a feeling that he may not be a steady follow through, get this job done right, and make sure I make money for everybody. I'm I'm concerned about the market too. Um, I think it is really interesting. This is a great use of artificial intelligence and putting different things together. But people don't like spending on security. 
That is a real struggle because people don't even want to think about it. Well, but, but, and then they think about it when something happens. Yeah, but think of big institutions. Yeah, you're sort of... Sure. They, I mean, they have somebody that is just in they, charge of security. Yeah, the big institutions and, move really slowly. But you they also have... think it's business. They also have a huge them. bucket of money that is geared towards security. So right. he knows where that, that may pot, be, pot of money right. is that he would be selling to. So he knows. He knows, right. he knows exactly He'll where find it is. He'll find it. I would back him. Uh, okay, well, let's find out with the crystal ball thing. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Eeny, beeny, crystal ball. Tell us, do we want cloud of structure? I got it. Okay, thumbs up. Thumbs down. Thumbs all around. Um, two up, one down. This is our thing. Yeah. We have two up, one down each time. It's yeah. just a different and we, sh we We should never do the deal if we all do thumbs up. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But it's not up to us. It's up to you, the viewers. Go to meetthedrapers.com and you can vote and invest. This is the only show in the world ever that allows you to invest in the companies that you see us interview while on Meet the Drapers. So this is awesome. And go ahead, give it a shot. So let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. And the eyebrows are genetic, apparently. Hi, my name is Damian Pelliccioni. My name is Aaliyah J. Daniels. And we are the co-founders of Reverie. The idea for the company for Reverie actually started off with Aaliyah <laughs> buying the brand new fourth generation Apple TV. We searched LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, zero apps popped up. That's when the light bulb went off and pitched them the idea of creating a queer global streaming network. It was really important for us when we were coming up with a concept for Reverie to make sure that we were having authentic representations and ensuring that we were creating a service where everyone within the community could find themselves and see their stories and see themselves being heard because traditionally that's not what's been the case. We're 75% POC owned, 75% queer owned, um, and two women of color. So we really represent the true gamut of what the rainbow flag means for our community. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Hi, my name is Damien Pelliccioni, and I am the fabulous CEO. My name is Aaliyah J. Daniels, and I'm the COO. Of Reverie, the world's first LGBTQ global streaming network. You can kind of think of us as Spotify or Hulu for young queer audiences. Currently, we're in 35 million homes in over 100 countries across the globe. And we're on track to be in over 200 million homes in just six short months. Reverie has over 4,000 hours of global queer content, including licensed and a growing collection of originals. Reverie is the home for queer feature films, series, music videos, and podcasts. The problem is that big brands can't target young queer audiences. They just don't buy broadcast television anymore. The style, the length of the content doesn't resonate with them. Reverie gives young queer audiences what they want. Multiple ways to watch amazing LGBTQ content via subscription, ad-supported, or rentals on multiple devices. This year alone, we've signed multiple six-figure deals with brands like Lexus and Dollar Shave Club. And the LGBTQ market is a whopping $917 billion a year a market here in the United States. $4.3 trillion globally. And our audience is growing. 52% of Gen Z and 35% of millennials identify somewhere in the queer spectrum. Reverie's diverse founding team has over 30 years of experience in the entertainment industry. From legal to production to tech, we have what it takes to solve this problem. So what did you guys do, do before this? My background is I actually used to teach at YouTube Space LA. I also worked in international biz dev for a company called Make TV, and I was doing work with Al Jazeera in Dubai, uh, MediaCorp in Singapore, and I'm a member of the Producers Guild. And my background is actually in legal, so I'm an attorney. I worked in entertainment as well as the startup space, so I was able to combine both of those loves when we created and How Reverie. long have you been building? We actually launched Consumer Facing here in San Francisco Pride June of 2016. And you said you had 
100 million people watching this? 35 million currently, and in six months, we'll be in 200 million. 35 million have, what, downloaded the app? No, we're available in over 35 million homes just in North America. What do you mean you're available? What does that mean? So just like broadcast television is available in so many homes, that's our reach, essentially. So you're on, like, what, What? Apple TVs? Apple TV, Chromecast, Roku, iOS, Android, Amazon Fire, the web. How many hours of television is consumed? every month. Our average consumer consumes 3.9 hours per week. Their subscription and And there's advertising. Mm -hmm. How many have actually paid for a subscription? We've had quite a few people pay us for subscription, but we've not spent a single dollar on marketing. Our biggest revenue comes from working with brands. How do you get the best content? Or are you buying the content? Are you making the content? We're licensing and we have originals. We commission them, we do co-productions, we work with other studios. We have a co-production deal with Funny or Die currently as well as we did a co-production for their show, Gay of Thrones, which was Emmy nominated this year. Gay of Thrones? Yes. Yep. You're grabbing the content as you go and you're building this following. You say we have 35 million reach or whatever, but how many people are actually watching your network? We have an average of 100 to 200,000 impressions organically. In How's a an impression ago. measured? An impression is a view, so you actually watch something for more than a second, then we're actually qualifying that as an impression. And our number two market is India, with no spend, no marketing spend at all. And if you don't know this already, they just decriminalized LGBTQ in India. So Brazil's in our top 10, China's in our top 10. What Canadians. I'm wondering about is, I mean, Netflix is spending hundreds of millions Billions. of dollars mm-hmm. making movies. So that content's going to be really top notch and they're going to be able to target the LGBT community because they're going to say, hey, clearly they have an interest in this kind of thing. And so why would people say, okay, I want to go go with Reverie when I can get all that same stuff with Netflix? Our audience is Gen Z and Millennial. They can sniff out inauthenticity in a second and they don't go for it. If they feel like you're just doing it because you want to capitalize off their community, they're going to turn their televisions off. But authentically, our business is the community. They are really specialized Mm -hmm. and everything that you watch is going to be down that alley. Uh, So it's quite different, I think. Yeah, and the big thing too is Netflix, they're not targeting our community, right? Like if you think of Queer Eye for a Straight Guy, that is for a mainstream heterosexual cisgender audience. It's not for our community. And they only have a limited amount of content that targets our community. What I love about it is it's got tightly knit, passionate community. And that's what I look for in companies is passionate audience because that's where your marketing ends up being. The thing that I want you to focus on is really like get your top 10% of users using it just all the time. Target them and everyone else will come. Like top 10%. You're working in Netflix's blind spot. Like that's what I'm thinking. Totally. You guys. Yeah. Like keep doing that. Just own it. Yeah. Yeah. The numbers. Yes. Yep. How how much money have you raised? We have only raised 879,000 in two rounds, seed and a seed extension. What does the balance sheet look like now? Not much, right? No, built the content, focused on evangelizing the brand and understanding the market. The number I'm (laughs) trying to get to is how many people are actually watching this. And then how many people have signed up on your site and you actually have their email address or their credit card? Over 20,000. Yeah, that's terrific. Good job. Thanks. Thanks. Terrific. Well, thanks for so much for coming to meet the Drapers. Great to meet you. Nice meeting you. It was so exciting to be able to explain everything that we're doing, and I think they really got it. They understand the opportunity, they understand the market, they understand the vision, and that this is such a big, big opportunity. You know, I think Bill Draper, the dad, was the most interested. He understood the LGBTQ community, and he understood the purchasing power and the scale on a global level of what we're actually creating with Reverie. I hope he invests. And look, the world is changing. Its views on our community are ever expanding thanks to marriage equality here in the United States. If you're a queer person in Saudi Arabia and South Africa and in India and in China and Brazil, you know that if you've got a little extra change in your pocket, investing in something like Reverie and seeing an authentic representation of your story is important to media and the further growth and acceptance and equality for LGBTQ people across the world. 
Anyway, let's see what the judges thought of Reverie. What did you think? I, I think the CEO embodies the brand, which I love, and it's a it's a big market, but a very passionate uh, group. There's a good shot that they could slowly grow and own Netflix's blind spot. They can't think that they're competing with Netflix right now. Everything is a big market now, so I love focus markets. There, there is some brilliance to this because that is a very positive community. Yeah. Dad, what did you think? The focus of their attention on, on a very clear growing market uh, is important. And uh, I think that they just need to get a small piece of it. And there'll be a lot of interest uh, and advertisers uh, will love it. I love the market. And... I thought she was great operations person. He is so fast talking that I got a little nervous about, you know, where the money went. Not this. the money guy. No. <laughs> True. He's, a, he's got the vision. He's got not, the vision. And people are going to love he's him because of that all. vision. <laughs> but he <laughs> is, we, that money will just disappear and nobody's going to know where it is it, unless she runs that part of the business. So, you know, they only, they only raise a million, I mean, it's a lot of money, but a million dollars. That was and, the other thing I didn't like. He said, well, it's only $970,000. And I thought, whenever they say only, I think, wait. No. I like when they say, we've already raised. No, it only took us $950,000 right. to get to where we are, which is fantastic. Yeah. Right. Took a while to get down to, yes, about 20,000 people have actually yeah, signed so on so it, we need to the to program. To it. It's not 35 million homes that we're reaching. It's yeah. no, 25,000 yeah. people, which is great. Yeah, actually, really really which is something I was thinking was great. I mean, 25,000 and they're making 300K a year. Like, it's not, like, it's not, that's a business. It's like, a business. It's a good business. I know, could be a good business. And, okay, well, let's, let's see what the crystal ball tells us about Reverie. Reverie, reverie. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> thumbs up, uh, thumbs okay. down, uh, thumbs uh, all uh, around. <coughs> I'm at three quarters, maybe two thirds. <laughs> you have to commit. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> you got I'm good. Commit. I'm good. Now come to Crypto Corner, where I will interview a crypto awesome person. Oh, Well, I'm here at Crypto Corner with Daniel De Silva. Veridoc is a security company that uses the blockchain to secure data. So why don't you fill us in? Tell us more about it. So Veridoc Global started in March 2015. That uh, originated Guy Scott, our current CEO, and Lindsay Maloney, our CEO for Tanzania, used to work in the education and the mining space. And in Australia, people were jumping behind big mining trucks and they were crashing these things because they weren't qualified to drive them. So what they did was they designed a piece of software that allowed an employer to scan a ticket and they could very quickly see whether they were actually qualified to drive that piece of machinery. A few years later, we ported that piece of software onto the blockchain, which made it even more secure. And today we've got our, block our blockchain leveraged verification system. Is that your target audience? Our target audience is federal governments, uh, banks, universities, basically document issuers. So anyone that's producing an official piece of document, whether it's an academic qualification or a passport or a driver's license, we're interested in helping them secure that document so that the end user, all of us, could just pull out a mobile phone, scan a QR code on that document, and very quickly see whether that piece of document is authentic or a fake. So universities, are that is a big part of your market. Academic qualifications get copied and, and produced all the time by black markets. So we had a, a doctor with fake qualifications doing operations on people and they were dying. Fake gynecologists, fake paramedics. So as a patient, will I be able to go up and scan my doctor's ID? Perhaps in the future, because we work with the document issuers. It has to come from the government level. It's no good a student of Draper University uploading their own document onto the blockchain because it could have been a fake one to begin with. Are you somehow stopping identity fraud? Identity fraud um, is a big one. There's all sorts of fraud. And I think being able to secure any sort of document is going to prevent fraudsters and scammers from taking advantage of 
people like us. What happens in 10 years? What happens to your business? What ha how does it evolve? I guess in 10 years time, we you know, look at a possibility of everything being digitized and only having a digital copy. I don't think that's gonna happen in the short term because I can't imagine people at an airport showing a passport on their mobile phone device. Everyone still needs a piece of paper. Think of all the things we do around trust to protect ourselves because of people who can hack into different things. What if identity were nailed? Beyond any shadow of a doubt, I know it's you. Once there's complete trust, so what happens to your business when that happens? Um, we all win. We've got a, a utility token that allows the user to create that transaction on the blockchain. And so as more and more governments and our banks start to use our solution, demand for, for that token will increase. Governments will get the benefit of less fraud. And but do you think the people who would buy those tokens are going to be the academic institution and the government, or are they going to be individuals? It'll be both. The institutions are by far the ones that are going through the most education. And as they see the benefit, they're the ones that are also buying the tokens because they need the tokens to secure their documents. But the end user who gets the benefit of verifying a document for free also sees the benefit of the token. So a lot of those end users end up becoming investors. Terrific. Is there anything else you want to add? No. You've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining me here on Crypto Corner. Thank you very much, Tim. This is terrific. Great. All the best to you. Let's wrap it up. Well, we had a great day. Yeah, I, I sure great. did. This was yeah. terrific. Wonderful entrepreneurs. Every one of them. They all, I love them all. They're the heroes. And they're the heroes. I think they were all pretty good. Which which one was your favorite of the three? So Dispatch, they're, they're a victim of me knowing too much. <laughs> and Cloud is structure, like, he wants to win. He's a great salesman. He's going to be selling to the enterprise. He needs to be, he needs to be a good salesman. And then Reverie, they're just excited and happy and like I, I want like I want them to win. That's my favorite at the end. My what was your favorite? Same. My favorite was dispatch because I've seen this data thing and I know where it's going. I have a good sense for what is going to happen with data. You're going to have your own data. I agree. And you're going to have it, then you're going to yeah. give it up into the cloud and these guys have somehow solved nimity of data. The bottom line <laughs> Who is the best Venture capitalist, I agree. No. We should not talk about no. this. <laughs> what really works, no joke, it is who the entrepreneurs are. I don't know who they were, who would be the best, even in my mind. But I think whoever it is, they have the passion, they have the fortitude, the willingness to break walls down, dictativeness in case uh, things go wrong, and they often do. And I learned a lot from just the questions that you guys ask. Yeah. So I think being with you was a good education for me. Well, it's also a little bit of a family gathering. That's right. Kind of a yeah. fun thing. Yeah, we're also good to, busy. That is Earth true. Is this is the only chance well, we get actually, to get together. Well, well, we have a standing breakfast every two weeks. Yeah. We, we sort of, we've sort of it's decided a, not to invite you. <laughs> <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we, we've met some good entrepreneurs. We have fun together. Uh, this has been very good. And I'll see you good. at breakfast on Thursday. See you there. Yeah. And in the meantime, <laughs> don't invite Tim. <laughs> uh, so, great. Let's see. Is there some something that we want to kind of conclude with here? I mean, we're just before the finale. What, okay. What's the most common advice that you give entrepreneurs? Actually, a couple of things. One is think bigger. Okay, think bigger. Are you uniquely qualified for this? Mm -hmm. Do you really care about this? And how are you going to make money? Are you going to actually have customers that are willing to pay you? Mm -hmm. So those three things. So if you're an entrepreneur out there, think about those three things. And my advice is really funny. He says think bigger minus focus. That's like the one thing I just drill into people's heads. Is it's like just execute focus on small, one big thing. vision, focus on the one thing. Right. Yeah. And what's your big piece of advice? Well, I like both of those. And I also think, first of all, you have to have the passion and the drive to be able to put up with very difficult times. And, uh, you have to recognize that 
without your energy and drive and creativity too, of course, this company is going nowhere. But having said that, it's very important to round out your soft spots, areas where you're not so good, find somebody as strong as you are or stronger to, to cover that area. Thank you all, and Adam, thank you for making time. I know this is really difficult because Boost is really taking off. Boom. It's, but it was good, good of you to spend a day with us interviewing these entrepreneurs. For the rest of you, come back next week for our finale at Meet the Drapers! When Satoshi Nakamoto the biggest blockchain event that has ever happened on the West Coast. Welcome to Token Fest. Blockchain will impact every major industry in the world. Hi, my name is Nathan Nichols, the CEO of Tax Token. Hey, my name is Graham Goddard. I'm with All Public Art, monetizing art in a way that's never been seen before. It has the potential to completely revolutionize the way we look at any marketplace. It will be used in two days to verify the Russian president election. We're using blockchain to give absolute trust and confidence. We're using blockchain. We're a blockchain-based company. Blockchain. Blockchain. Blockchain is the future. Thank you for coming. This is the beginning. Live long in blockchain.